This is Eric Rutan of Cannibal Corpse. You are listening to the Scars and Guitars podcast with Andrew McKay-Smith. Thanks so much for joining me for another installment of the show, this time around featuring two members of the Danish group Mool. You'll be hearing from vocalist Kim Song Sternkopf and guitarist Nikolai Hansen. The catalyst for the conversation is the release of their second album titled Diorama. I'm enjoying this one a lot, it must be said. It'll be out on November 5, 2021 via Nuclear Blast. So we talk all about the album and as you've come to, come to expect on the podcast, a heap of other topics, all sorts of things. Before we get to the chat though, let's have a listen to a sample of a new tune titled Photophobic. Here we go. How's things? James, are uh, great. <laughs> right. Yeah. Sorry about last week too, guys. The nuclear blast I've just sent through so many interviews and inevitably I screwed one up and it just happened to be yours, so I apologise for that. Yeah, yeah. No, I heard worries. That. no worries, man. It's just honestly I've had, my, being on the other side of the world, as you no doubt are aware, yeah. I have, most of my interviews are conducted at about 4, 4.30, 5, 5.30 in the a.m., my goodness, yeah. It's brutal. <laughs> Which isn't, it, I've got to tell you, because I've got a job, I work because I'm a journo, so work during the day, but I've got to get the kids up in time and all the rest of it. So it's not too bad, but um, occasionally what happens is by the time I get to about sort of 7, 8 and 9 p.m. in the evening, I'm just zombied out. Yeah. It's, a fr- <laughs> it's a Friday night here, so I've got my vodka. My vodka all for right. you guys. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But um, I'm glad we can finally connect because... I am enjoying your album. I've got yeah. to tell you. Yeah. I mean, look, as I say, I do a lot of these interviews, but dioramas seriously impressed me. I, I know you guys get this that, oh, you know, it sounds a bit like Death Heaven or something. No, it doesn't. It's different. Thank you've got you. a lot of you've got a lot of other things going on in there. And uh, it's music that I put on in the background when I'm in the car or when I'm seeing my chair. I don't know whether you can see my chair behind me or I sit down in the chair. Oh, yeah. And I can see out the sky over here and I'm just driving in the car, it's in the background, but I can look up into the sky and it just takes me to another place. I love that. That's the kind of escapism that we were aiming for. (laughs) What's what's reaction then been like from, you know, the journo types on the Zoomers? In in Denmark? Oh, in in Australia and all over the world, yeah. I think it's generally been very positive yeah. so far. We haven't seen a lot of uh, reviews yet, um, hmm. neither in Denmark or anywhere else. There's been a couple. Of, uh, yeah, yeah, but but we've we've seen you know chattering about in the, in the corners like Twitter feeds like oh seriously check this is going to be huge and stuff like that. So we we are we are quite uh, excited to see what uh, you know what ends up in the reviews. You know, it's a sophomore album, so it is. Yeah. Uh, trying to to you know um, fill in the gap between the 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 debut album and this uh, has been uh, has been quite exciting. Um, I think at least for for your part to try and trying to explore, you know, or expand or 
uh, the sound in a yeah. direction. And I think also writing the album, it's not really, not really been like, okay, we want, I want this sound for the record. Mm. It's been like a natural development and evolution from, from your. Um, and of course, also inspired by the bands that I listen to a lot of the time, but I think it's sort of a natural progression from the, the previous record. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I haven't heard the previous album, I've got to say, but I did come up with some descriptors for this one here. So what I said was that it's it's full of swirling blackened metal dipped in acid. That's what it <laughs> seems like to me. <laughs> you reckon that's a reasonable reasonable comparison? Maybe I don't know about the acid part, but yeah, definitely I can get the feel. <laughs> <laughs> Probably the way I would describe it, of course, also would be like ethereal and atmospheric, and, yeah. and that's probably also where the the acid yeah. part comes in. So, um, yeah, the, I, I, I accept it. Cool. Um, yeah. Well, it's a compliment. Believe me, it's a it's meant to be a compliment. But you know, I know how these things. You know, they're they're one person's perception of your music. You know, yeah, and you yeah. guys are the creators. So, but Frank Frank Tour. That's the name. Is that right? Frank Tour. So Frank Tour. Uh, Frank Tour. That yeah. has like a bending sound. It feels like as though you're bending. Yeah, what's that effect? That's magnificent. It's, uh, it's uh, an effect I stole from uh, Kevin Shields from My Bloody Valentine. Uh-huh. If you know that band. I do very uh, well. Great band. Yeah, <laughs> so one of my favourite uh, yeah. guitarists and one of my favourite bands. So um, I, I wanted to try and incorporate that effect, so basically bending the tremolo uh, on, on the rhythm guitar, um, and that kind of gets, gets that very sort of yeah, dipping, Ooh. almost wailing kind of uh, oh, sound. Oh, magnificent. Like, yeah, I love it. So uh, hopefully, um, I, I, I didn't want to overuse it, and I, I, um, I wanted to do it where it was appropriate. Yeah. So um, and you did. Yeah. <laughs> I, I was I was wowed by it when I heard it the first time. It's like, what's what's going on there? <laughs> it's an interesting yeah. sound. Very interesting. It captured my attention. You can see I'm, I play guitar and bass, and uh, yeah. I listened to it, and and I thought, wow, the, the only other person that I've heard doing something similar in a metal context, and. Listeners of the podcast know I rave about this guy all the time, but Trey from Morbid Angel. Mm, yeah. And Formula's Fatal to the Flesh. There's yeah. a bit of that sort of stuff going on where it's like, but he's just using the tremolo, no effect. But it's it's that it's almost like it's a dense, heavy riff that's sort of warping time and space as it goes along. Mm. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Gives it that's a nice check as well, I think. Um, so, yeah, it's hard to describe exactly what the sound is other than it's uh, compelling and uh, intriguing and... Uh, yeah. yeah, definitely. Do you, do you write the songs fairly straightforward and then do you go and layer these effects afterwards or do you write them with the effects in mind? Mm, that's difficult. Sometimes, no, I think um, I think usually I'm, I'm just experimenting with the uh, guitar effects and then uh, seeing what happens, what comes up with, uh, with regards to riffs. And I think for that part uh, on, on Factura, I uh, I tried out different things. I knew the chords and I thought they sounded pretty cool and what could I do more to make it more interesting? And I thought, okay, why not try doing something like one of my favorite guitarists and uh, it worked worked out. And like the core idea of that song actually came up with Ken being very insistent on you doing that tapping part in yeah. the start, like yeah. do that again, that's the song. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> It, it took quite a while because usually you know, in the start, uh, that song was basically just the opening riff, yeah. the, the tapping uh, stuff. Uh, and I thought it was a bit uh, cheesy and, and corny and I, I didn't consider myself a guitarist that liked to tap, uh, and even though it's not like very technical. But um, yeah, and it, so it, it kind of brought in a lot of new things. Mm. Yeah, yeah, it gives that sense of, a sense of an opener, uh, just as we had with uh, Storm uh, at the other album. Um, yeah, yeah. It's, there's so many different. Oh my, so, sorry about this, uh, Kim. I'm a guitarist and bassist, as I mentioned, so I tend to ask <laughs> the guitarists and the bassists a lot of questions. But you're, you're deploying so many different techniques on this album. It's almost like a history of heavy metal, hard rock and indie rock combined into one. Yeah. Well, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, I think it's a very precise description, yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, and it's probably also where a lot of my influences come from. I'm not a, a schooled metal guitarist. I didn't start out there. I started out listening to Sonic Youth and My Bloody Valentine. And well, you can those tell. Kind of That's great. Yeah. That's a fantastic place to start. 
Yeah, and so I've always always been intrigued by you know, different guitar techniques, not necessarily that I use a lot of them. Again, Sonic Youth is a uh, a different world of its own uh, with regards to guitar, um, but I think it's more like the the mindset that, um, that you can do a lot with the guitar, and it doesn't need to sound like you know a uh, an overdriven uh, high gain rhythm uh, or yeah whatever. I, I don't think Thurston Moore and Lee Ronaldo get enough credit for yeah, their contribution to guitar playing from a technical perspective in that it opened they opened up a new universe of sounds. Same, Tom Morello kind of did too, but I really like what those two guitarists did in Sonic Youth because it's so fucked up. It's so messed yeah. up, but it, it's often, it often sounds like as though they can't play, but it's not the case. Yeah. They're, just, they're going for these weird sounds. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, also one of, yeah, some of my favourite guitarists. I love them. Killer, killer. Now, now, insofar as the lyrical themes, Kim, what did you dive yeah. into this time around? Well, this time around, it's it's it, I see it as uh, as a progression, or uh, well, or as kind of as a, a succession from uh, from the previous work. I ended out the the lyrical themes um, on your on a, quite a dark note, uh, and. Uh, the previous album was really centered around extent, existentialism and uh, you know losing sense of meaning in 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 you know in a in a world that where we as humans we we tend to um, you know uh, put a lot of significance into our about our lives and our existence, but you know eventually we'll we're going to end up in the dirt at one point. Uh, so that's one of the reasons why that album is called Your. It means Earth, and you know. Okay. And, uh, but um, this, if if that was like the outlook, or at least the um, the uh, a perspective, or an an extra uh, an, an external look on the world, then this is way more uh, centered around introspection. Um, so, uh, for reference, like I, I've, I've, I've actually used. Um, I'm really inspired by movies, and and for this album, uh, it's no no different. Like um, I like uh, Ari Aster's work in uh, Hereditary. Um, it's a horror movie, and um, it uh, it revolves around this uh, artist who who has a really troubled family history and her way of dealing with trauma is, um, is making miniature models, dioramas of uh, really traumatic experiences in her life. So that's a way of her trying to cope with things around her. But as the movie progresses, she actually gets sucked more and more into some of the trauma that actually happens as she's, you know, She's making them. She's, you know, adding new pieces and stuff like that, and that it's actually ends up uh, consuming her instead of, of you know, working through those traumatic uh, events. So I feel that that was a really great offset to, you know, to to an, an emotional narrative throughout the, uh, the the album's tracks. We really focus a lot on dynamics in our sound, and I feel that the um, that each song has its own theme or, or of sort. It ha it doesn't. There's no song that you know sounds particularly like one of the other. Uh, so yeah, I I really like uh, how uh, when we create track lists that that we can get, kind of get this sense of a journey that you go through you, you with, with an opener, a clear opener, uh, mid and, you know, a conflict and then maybe an epilogue at the end. That That's at least as, as how I see it. Um, Twist in the second last track is the, you know, the final battle. I think the point of no return is some of the other tracks uh, um, in, in the beginning, like Photophobic and then uh, Diorama is kind of like the epilogue. Um, Okay, yeah, great explanation for what's going on with the lyrics and the way you've been able to tie the lyrical themes together through the song structures. So, so look, on that front, how did you guys approach the recording side of things? Was it the traditional approach with, you know, drums first and then started to layer the strings and then the vocals sort of came after all of that was done? Is that how it worked? 
Pretty, pretty much, yeah. A perfect explanation of what happened. So we, we recorded <laughs> the album with, uh, with two masks, and, and uh, it was at the high light of Corona. So um, and also with regards to our work situation mm. and personal lives, we couldn't actually be in the studio together. So yeah. Ken, the drummer, uh, oh, right. started out recording the drums, and then I came into the studio uh, with uh, Frederick, and then we recorded uh, the guitars. And then it was uh, quite unnerving for Ken, I know. Yeah. Like, yeah. oh. Well, we will make up this fill right now, yeah. right here. Uh, yeah, well, and then the, yeah. Holder, uh, the bass player, and then finally Kim. Uh, yeah. what, what, what we did was actually okay. So, so Tua would uh, like do a quick mix of the drums, and then send them to me if I had any uh, suggestions or uh, opinions about a certain fill or mm. a variation, um, and then I would just quickly listen to it and then send my opinion about it, and then they would go on uh, recording. Um, I think it was also kind of you know, doing it very individually also helped out not not everything being up for debate mm. uh, in the studio. Oh my god! So, yeah. Uh, yeah, you can <laughs> save a lot of difference. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Everyone wants their say, so we basically just go in, do it, and then I think luckily, uh, Tua Madsen is also uh, very opinionated about uh, mm -hmm. these guitars and I think also yeah. drums. So uh, you would also. He uh, come come up with suggestions and his mm. opinions about okay. how things should sound and uh, yeah yeah yeah. Now, was the album conceived, recorded, mixed, and mastered throughout COVID? So, is this album totally a product of you guys having to work through COVID, or was some of it done not, before? Not necessarily. I think we 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 actually ended up you know, sending demos to Holy Roar Records at that at, at before, yeah. before. So a nuclear blast actually knew what uh, some of, you know, the direction that we were going in and um, being able to present that before we entered the studio was actually kind of cool. We had a, we had a lot of conf or at least a lot of trust from them uh, that we would, you know, follow up with a, with, with something, that they believed in. Um, so it's, I, I think it's, it's been, you know, seeing the things coming to fruition when, you know, all the puzzle pieces comes together and we, we got the, the, the master, uh, or at least the, the final mix, it, it everything kind of came full circle. It was a pretty nice way to rediscover <laughs> the whole thing again. Yeah. Nice. Okay. Yeah. Now, um, labels are stupid, but they're often necessary. We know that. And you guys are more or less uncategorizable, but um, <laughs> the, 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 stre I mean, the streaming service thing is so important, getting your music into these algorithms so as though fans can listen to it because 90% of fans won't buy physical, probably higher. 95% of people who hear the music will hear it over streaming services. So... How, how do you work in with Nuclear Blast? I've never asked a band this before, and I think you guys are a great band to ask this, but how do Nuclear Blast submit it to Spotify? So I was like, you get get then picked up on, is it black metal playlist? Is it metalcore playlist? Is it black gaze playlist? You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. Uh, with regards to how they work, I think they have someone basically working with, uh, with Spotify and uh, like a consultant or someone who's, Pitching songs mm. to uh, Spotify and uh, Apple and Deezer and what they're called, Tidal. Um, mm. So I think that's how they go about it. Um, mm. But I also think, yeah, that's just my opinion again on these uh, on these playlists. Sure. And too much focus is, is, is on them, and basically mm. it, it makes or breaks a band whether you get on the playlist or not. Yep. Uh, Great. We were quite anxious in the start uh, if we were ever going to hit any of them with the tracks, but. Luckily, I, I think uh, at least Vestige and, and uh, Surf, they both ended up uh, on some pretty major ones. And um, I think that's due to at least the length and how, uh, at least uh, how to the point uh, many of those songs actually are, are kind of written. Um, yeah. but, but I'd say it's... You know, there are some bands that are easier to pitch, I, I think, uh, but... I think our way of structuring songs has uh, some clear like advantages in, in it might not be like four and a half minutes but but uh, what's going on there's it's not like a, a half a half an hour 
post rock song where you you really wait to get to the point uh, and you get to the point at um, at 20 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> so we that's one of the things that that we have going for us is actually the formula of of skipping to you know the real the, the leads yeah, so it's more concise but i don't think yeah i, I at least would like to avoid writing mm. for playlists yeah. and, and spotify and streaming yeah. um because i think that's also i think a general tendency that uh, when we start to dictate songwriting uh, i think that's an, an issue and it sort of limits the again the creativity yeah i think so but again you also have to <laughs> to make it as a band and you need to stream and uh, or otherwise you will just perish um, mm -hmm. yeah so it's a dilemma but but we have intentionally written this as an album like uh, yeah. that's that's at least how we we like it and we we consume album formats where that that's one of the things that i think we all love is how you can listen to a work and uh, a full work of a band and then say like I, I really dug that experience I put time aside to listen to this like really listen um, and uh, give it that kind of attention that I, I think a lot of artists do deserve uh, when they put out something into the world uh, like that um, so at least for I, I'm a vinyl collector, you're a vinyl collector as well. Mm. Like it's, this album really fits that format uh, quite well. Um, so I, I, I believe that there's a, uh, at least some of the goals that we want to achieve with our music, like giving people a break from their really busy um, everyday lives and, you know, zone out for a bit, you know, get lost in, in that healthy, a kind of escapism that our music presents that that is i think a philosophy that you can apply to to how we want the at least how we prefer the format of the album being listened to yeah fantastic points you know i'm in my mid-40s so I, I grew up as a kid with cds and tapes i remember tapes cassettes when they were you could buy them in yeah. shops and then CDs, vinyl wasn't around when I was a kid. That was just, you know, honestly, it would sound ludicrous oh, now, but it was good. <laughs> yeah, well, it was considered junk. They were giving them away in the 80s and 90s, yeah. you know. I mean, there was like one pressing plant left in Australia, I think, by the time vinyl actually came back into vogue again. So it was very hard to get vinyl pressed in this country. Um, mm -hmm. I think the same thing was going on in Denmark and in Europe as well. I think, I think yeah. most of them, I could be wrong, but I think a lot of vinyl ended up getting pressed in Russia. Because that's where the plants ended up. Did you hear that? Yeah, yeah. I think that's what happened. Yeah, like at least you know Russia and the Czech Republic. Like I know that Nuka gets a lot there from from there. We actually ended up uh, using a Danish uh, pressing plant uh, for for our release um, RPM in in, uh, in Copenhagen because we could get them uh, I, if we didn't like uh, put uh, our. And if if we were to you know go to any of the bigger plants, we would have the vinyls by twenty three, <laughs> and we we didn't want to wait that long. Did you hear what happened to Don Brocco? No, no. So I'm going by my memory here, but the pressing plant for either their CDs or their vinyl fucked up and misspelled things on the front. I mean, I know this is the sort of thing that collectors no. might like, but when you do it for X amount of thousands of copies that are going to go out before Christmas for fans. So I'll need to check this and anybody listening will just check on their socials because they talked about it. I've interviewed Cy Delaney from Don Broca, great band, great guy as well, Cy, but... No. They've been in a real pickle there, I think, because I don't think they'll have their um, their physical copy for the people that have ordered it until mm -hmm. after Christmas, okay? Such is the demand on physical yeah. pressing plants at this point in time. So it's 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 come so far oh, around yeah. circle, oh. the demand mm -hmm. on, on physical, the, the fans' demand for physical copy. I, I haven't seen anything like it, certainly in the last 15 or 20 years. You know, yeah, that you know that, that trying to meet that demand uh, at a time where like resources are kind of are kind of scarce, at least for I know there were some of the components for vinyl pressing vinyls that that were uh, delayed at some ship mm. at, at uh, I think down in the Suez Canal. Yeah, uh, I heard about that. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. 
um, I know they, they, they missed a lot of like chemical components for, for pressing. Um, so, you know, that, that, that just comes to show that, uh, you know, like real life events has a way of, uh, if interrupting with uh, the industry and, and everybody trying to <laughs> figure out a way to produce things on their own, um, that, that might be how we actually end up maybe supporting local businesses a bit, bit more than something being, being done in, uh, on the other side of the world. No, I agree, and and I noticed for I could I can now buy we all can uh, via mail order, so you can go on Amazon or what have you. But a brand new with new tech, so new technology in a brand new cassette player from Japan. I can't remember what? who it is that's making it. Yeah, I love cassettes, right? Because I still got a lot of my old ones. Um, yeah. But apparently, the the promise it might be Toshiba. I think it might be Toshiba. People check this, but yeah, you can go on Amazon and you can buy the bloody thing on eBay, and you can buy the thing. And uh, I want to do it because you can. I don't know if you can see my little. Uh, play there that I, bought, <laughs> I bought for my kids, you see, and I just use that to play in the background as I'm tip tip tapping away over here on, yeah. the, on the keyboard doing my work. But yeah, there's this. There's so many different ways you can consume music, and of course, vinyl I think is the perfect way to listen to what you guys have done here with dioramas. So, uh, is is there? I mean, I'll ask the question: Is there plenty of? It'll be out on November five. So. Is there, is there plenty of copies available for people? Because your music is just going to sound stunning over vinyl. There, there should be. Yeah. There should be. I think nuclear pressing a lot and uh, we have got a mm. few, I don't know how many, few, few hundred. hundred yeah. Yeah. So uh, there, there should be enough and hopefully it's, it's accessible throughout the world and available for purchase and uh, yeah. yeah. When, when you've been having chats with people like me, people of an Anglo-Celtic background, what's the most ludicrous pronunciation of your band name that you've heard <laughs> don't think they're necessarily that bad I think uh, they're, people they're, are pretty good usually they just fall back on like mole yeah uh, yeah it's close enough uh, and, but the, the yeah the Scandinavian U uh, is just you know it's, yeah. it's something to I think yeah, the French usually get pretty close yeah. uh, with uh, with Mille. 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 Yeah. Mille. yeah. <laughs> Uh, but, but I think yeah, mule <laughs> is perfectly acceptable. And uh, yeah, well, I, was the Swedes who said like mule, mule? That, Maybe, or yeah. there's one. Uh, there, there was one language where where mule was the same, uh, pronounced the same as like shit in their <laughs> language. That's a non- <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. <laughs> mule means shit, shit in Norwegian. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> That's interesting. I, I thought Danish and Norwegian were very close cousins. Uh, in terms yeah, of the, the language, are, there are a few, uh, few words in Danish and Norwegian that are like flipped. Yeah. Um, so like, they're uh, odd. They're odd. Uh, we say hard, which means uh, it's it's nice. In Norwegian, it wouldn't be uh, weird. In, in Norwegian, yeah. yeah in Norwegian, oh, right. so, yeah. So yeah, hard in Danish is nice, but really weird. <laughs> yeah. It's like there was a car in, it might, it might have just been in the Australian market, but made by Mitsubishi. Everybody knows Mitsubishi, but. Um, it was a four-wheel drive called a Pajero. Does that ring a bell? Mitsubishi Pajero? <laughs> no, it, 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 it would have been in, in Denmark, but it would have been called something else. Anyway, when they started exporting this Mitsubishi Pajero to Brazil, in Portuguese, Pajero is a slang term for wanker. So they had this car called, <laughs> <laughs> called the Mitsubishi Wanker or something like that. And, uh, and, uh, and so, so these... Well, yeah, these things if happen. You ever go, <laughs> if you ever go to Denmark, we have a we have a town called Middelfart. So, Middelfart is that like a, yeah, Middelfart? And I think in Norway, it's not really a you know mistranslation, but hell. They got a, a town called Hell yeah, up there, yeah, I think, yeah. which all of the metal you see all the metal fans. Like if you type in Hell Norway, I'm going to see all the metal fans <laughs> with, with their Motorhead t-shirts and Mayhem t-shirts on up there <laughs> doing that. But yeah, it's funny, isn't it? When, when things get, you know, there's, oh, you know, you, you get, uh, Australia is a very multicultural country, as I'm sure as you're aware, you're, you're Danish, oh. so you're very educated about these things. But occasionally I talk to people from parts of the world who think we're all Crocodile Dundee, which is really <laughs> odd because most people haven't even heard of or seen Crocodile Dundee in Australia. <laughs> it was big overseas. <laughs> big here too at the time, but it didn't carry on. But yeah. um yeah, there's there's all these sort of these cultural inflections that you think erode specifically to the culture that actually come from other people's perception of the culture. Non, mm. they're not born from within. They're sort of things that are sort of taken from outside. Like we don't call. Uh, pra- Do you know what prawns are? 
Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You do. Okay. I was talking to a fella in the US the other night and uh, Donny from uh, Donny V from Enough's Enough. And uh, mm. he, uh, we were talking about the difference between shrimp and prawns. And when I was a kid, I yeah. didn't know what a shrimp was. I had no idea, but then it's an American. Well, Bobby. Yeah, that one. I didn't know what it was as a kid. I remember hearing it and thinking, what the hell are they talking about? <laughs> Indeed, yeah. But no, I know it means moth, though, doesn't it? The band name. Or, or yeah. Uh, yeah. And, uh, so, uh, yeah, we, we weren't really. The so, main premise for picking a name uh, with. It had to be like short and simple, and had to be Danish. Yeah. And so, um, yeah. And What's well, the ugliest uh, insect we can find? Yeah. <laughs> oh, it's a ridiculous question. But do you get big moths in in Denmark, like you get here? You know, the giant ones. Yeah, well, they usually like these yeah, yeah, small, small ones to get in your clothes and, uh, and eat them up. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think death head moths, you know, from like uh, movies like uh, Silence of the, the sure. Lambs and stuff like that. It, you know, yeah. you know that's the the easy connotation. Uh, but I think at least for the EP, that's one of the good old, really scrawny, uh, ugly looking ones. There's one in the, in my mother's bathroom, so I just took a picture of it and yeah. came the, uh, the album cover. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. oh, cool. <laughs> yeah, but we don't really have any like uh, crazy uh, animals in Denmark. Uh, maybe no, like no. Uh, what do you call it? No, I don't know. A badger? Badger maybe? Bear. Yeah. <laughs> no bears yet. They have. We we have. We recently got wolves, but a lot of people will, shoot them. Yeah, they just <laughs> shoot them because uh, yeah. they're not supposed to be here. Have they have they been reintroduced into Denmark? Have they? Is yeah, yeah, they from? have. Uh, I think they migrated from uh, from Germany, and uh, like there are a couple of maybe like like a handful of wolves in, in Denmark. Yeah. Uh, there was a case a few years ago with like a, a farmer who shot one of them. Yeah, uh, yeah. He got a fine, yeah. or at least I think he got. Yeah, maybe yeah. he got his uh, weapons license revoked. Yeah. So, um, oh wow. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm just yeah. looking forward to us getting a greater biodiversity with uh, some, you know, uh, maybe. Uh, it would be cool to see some, uh, what's those big Norwegian things? Elk, no, elk. <laughs> yes. Uh, with bears. <laughs> bears? You want, you need a bear. <laughs> no, probably yeah. not, yeah. Well, I'm, I'm sure you're talking about the way other cultures perceive your culture. The Viking thing's huge globally. I'm sure you're yeah. aware of that. Do you get asked, do, do, do anybody get a bit silly and they start asking about the Viking themes and stuff? Yeah, well, I, I had one question revolving about that, like how do we, well, that's that's the weird thing. Like there are some edge lords out there that doesn't mm. uh, like black metal being touched by uh, people from Asia or, uh, or yeah, like we're stealing our their heritage um, yeah. by yeah there, there are voices like that out there um, you've got that a, feedback you've, you've got you've got that feedback yeah, you? yeah I got that what one forum at one point uh, or at least I, I, I just almost couldn't believe my ears like really okay so I'm stealing your cult, your black metal culture by screaming like have you ever you know, seen Japanese black metal? There, there is actually such a thing. <laughs> it's, Look, there's no, there's no Saudi Arabian uh, black metal. There's black metal in yeah. every country. Every country, <laughs> yeah. there is a black metal band somewhere. There just is. I can tell you that for a fact because I've found them. I, I researched late at night, and you know, when I've got some time, yeah. and the kids have gone to bed, and there was a compilation I got recently that had a lot of Saudi and Iranian black yeah. and death metal bands. Oh, yeah, they're, they're there, out there. There must be a lot of reason in in. You know, in you know, in Iran, in Iran, in Iran, Iran <laughs> uh, to to make a black metal band, but wonder if well, they're outlaw. <laughs> well, it's interesting. Some of them are anti-Islamic, so instead of being anti-Christian, they're anti-Islamic. I mean, you've got to be extremely careful in those countries if you're going to oh, do yeah. that stuff. But, uh, but I mean, they got huge balls. Some of some of them are all girls or all female. Yeah. Balls. Oh yeah, yeah. I saw that. Yeah. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's very brave. Yeah. It's amazing. Really great. Yeah. It's yeah. amazing. Yeah. Um, so I'll, I'll make this my last question for you. And we kind of touched on it, I suppose. But look, the touring thing through COVID, God knows when. I, I I have a feeling our borders will be opened up by mid next year. 
yeah. okay, to international, like in terms of when you can possibly tour and book tours and stuff, because mm-hmm. Guns N' Roses are coming in November of next year and they wouldn't, you know, they were coming in November of this year, but it's been pushed out. But but for yeah. you guys, I mean, Nuclear Blast are really all about, I mean, you've got this great label who can give you the support so that you can go on tour. So obviously there in, are, must be intentions to tour, but have you have you tentatively booked any dates offshore yet? Not offshore. Not offshore. No, still, the focus is on on Europe, and uh, there are some places in Europe that we haven't gone to. We haven't actually done a Scandinavian. No, not at all. Uh, yeah. But I would, I would definitely love to go to uh, like Australia, New Zealand, yeah. Asia, also the US would be uh, mm. it's definitely on the bucket list as well. Um, and it makes sense also with regard to where our listeners are as well. Yeah. So, uh, mm. do you have a bucket list? Of course. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, Asia's fantastic for metal. I mean, I've interviewed Filipino black metal bands, as I say, and stuff, and um, it's huge all the way through. It just seems to be. I interview. I, I did a participated recently in a. Um, or what would you call it? It was a Zoomer where I couldn't ask questions because the young ladies they're from Indonesia, so full on hijab. Wow, playing, playing. It's it sounds a bit like a cross between Rage Against the Machine. Um, 24-7 spies and maybe faith no more, but it's still metal, We're unashamedly metal. These ladies are bringing it. Voice of Bass Pro is the name of this band. See, the thing with, with playing metal in those kind of places, that is, you know, real rebellion. <laughs> yeah. That, that is as, as punk as you can get, uh, especially if you're living in a really authoritarian uh, regime. Mm. Like... That really takes some guts. <laughs> yeah, it, it does. I mean, my point though is, I mean, you've got you've got a, a you've got some music here that can cross some serious boundaries. Mm-hmm. You know, so I mean, I mean, touring and playing live though, that's our fire pit as metal fans, isn't it? You know, we see it too many times. Have I watched a band after listening to them on CD or whatever it might be, MP3, but seeing them, their music makes sense. Mm-hmm. And I'd love to see you guys live on that basis. You know, you make you make sense on on album already, but I'd love to see what you guys sound like live. I think we can't have our music at least without the the the, the live part. I, I you know I like when we write stuff, but I am I am a live musician. That that is one of the the places where I thrive at least. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I think you know. The one thing that I'm really excited about is how we can build uh, and some really diverse play, uh, you know, uh, set lists out of the material that we have right now. Mm. Um, so I'm really excited to see, you know, that's the possibility with our genre or non, you know, whatever you want to define us as. We we can play with really really heavy bands, but we can also play with, uh, you know, almost you know, rock bands, uh, and still fit the bill. Um, so, you know, that just, yeah, that, that is a, you know, a big possibility of, uh, that could open up a lot of, of venues, at least with this, uh, with the sound that we were trying to you know, pursue, pursue on, on, the, on this record in particular. Yeah, you've done a great job. You know, as an old Lush fan of the band Lush, that's another reference for you. Mm-hmm. Um, Desire Lines. How, gosh, if, guys, if you haven't heard the song Desire Lines, check it out after our after our chat here. Um, yeah. Just, just fantastic atmosphere on that track there. But it's you can't be influenced by one song, I know, but you'll identify aspects of your music without realizing because you probably haven't heard that song, of course. But you listen to what they're doing there, you go, oh, it brings on the same feelings. Big believer in the way music can evoke music can evoke feeling. So you've done a great job on the album. Congratulations on doing that. I just so I should say this quite a lot at the moment. I just would love to see you guys down here. I just fingers crossed it can happen and we all get to, yeah, we'd love to go witness them all spectacle. But <laughs> <laughs> we can live up to it. Yeah. Well, uh, sure we have to. one reference for you at least. Uh, if you want to listen to a band that that we're like really great fans of. Uh, Mew uh, from here from Denmark might be a really good place to start. I know that friend, the Fringers album is mm. is one of your main inspirations. Yeah, and also the band, uh, the, the album called and, and the Glass and the yeah, Tracks. Yeah, exactly. Really great. Um, How do I spell yeah. that band name? Is it M E W? 
W Mew. Okay, gotcha. I'll go check them out for sure. Yeah. yeah. There, there is another band, my, probably my favorite rock band ever. I speak to a lot of Danish artists, I've got to say, and there are a lot of Danish people living in Australia. You might not know that, but there's quite a few. Um, but um, Black Income is the name of a rock band from Denmark. Fantastic. Black yeah, Very Black enough. Income. I have a Another band to check out. I mean, if you've got time, check them out. Yeah, I mean, it's I, I don't know. Um, the fellow who's behind it, awesome guy too. I'm friends with him on Facebook. Um, but, uh, yeah, no, definitely a Danish band. I think he's in Copenhagen. Um, yeah. and But just like a band that seemed to get, take that grunge alternative rock sound right to the meeting point of where it becomes metal, but just steps yeah. back from the line and still got that alternative grunge sound to it. Yeah. Just, just killer, yeah. Really urgent stuff. I was so shocked when I heard it. It was probably the best rock release I'd heard in like 20 years or so. Previous to that, it was Weezer's Pinkerton. And then I heard that and I was like, that's the first time I've felt that the way I feel since Pinkerton. You know, mm-hmm. so D- Denmark, what well, my point is, Denmark's producing some absolutely amazing music at the moment. Yeah, that's also what we think. Yeah. Uh, the bands and the, uh, the level of quality is, is quite high right now. Yeah. Uh, a lot of good bands, especially within metal. Yeah, so it's awesome yeah. to, to be in Denmark right now mm-hmm. in terms of music. Yeah, definitely represent. Denmark represents. So, gents, thanks so much for the chat. Good luck with everything. Um, look, if we don't get to see you down here, no doubt I'll be chatting to you in the, in the coming future and in the future on your next release when you're doing the promo for that. Sure, hopefully. Fingers crossed. Bye, no worries, you. Yeah. Likewise. Nice to meet you. For sure, guys. All right, good luck with everything again and chat again soon. Thank thanks. you. Bye-bye. Thanks a lot. Catch ya. So there you have it, a conversation featuring two members of Mool, a Danish outfit. You heard from Kim Song Sternkopf, he's the vocalist, and Nikolai Hansen, he's the guitarist. If you enjoyed that conversation, there are many more just like it over at scarsandguitars.com. I'm going to get sick of saying this, I think, so I should think of a better outro. But anyway, I'll continue. If you could like, subscribe, and share, I'd appreciate it, but even better, post a comment, but a nice one, a good one, something that will share your appreciation of what you just heard. My name's Andrew Mackay-Smith, and I'm the host of the Scars and Guitars podcast series that doesn't syndicate for the A-List online anymore. Don't even know why I'm putting that in there. But anyway, until next time, it is a very goodbye for now.